Moravia, okay. Moravia, that's the eastern part of the Czech Republic. Okay, Moravia. So is it, is, it, is the model the river Moravia? Okay. Public. Let me see if I can figure out how to do this here. That's, that's better. So I'm ready to share. Should I share my screen or you, you want to have the... No, you can share document. that. Okay. Just interrupt the sharing. Can go to full screen mode. Does, is this working the right way? Oh, I have the window. Yes. I need to close this one. <clears throat> so we'll be ready to start soon. Correct? Yes. Maybe we'll wait for two minutes or something. Sure, no problem. <clears throat> And you can see the mouse as a pointer, correct? When I'm moving the mouse around the screen, yes, you guys can see that, right? Okay, so I'll use that as a as a pointer. I don't have a fancier version of a pointer. Hopefully, this will be sufficiently visible. By the way, I also emailed you the. PDF file yes. with the slides, just in case if something goes wrong, we can improvise. So maybe we can start. Let me start recording. Sounds good. <clears throat> 
Zhang Hao's slide has some something blocking. I'm not sure. Oh, oh yeah, that works now. Okay. Welcome everyone to Harvard CMS Quantum Matter in Math and Physics seminar series. Dobradin, Bidada Shishni. Today we are very honored to have a invite to invite a Professor Petra Hojava speaking. And Professor Hojava is based in Berkeley and he has done numerous important work, including a collaboration on this Hojava Witten theory, domain world theory. Uh, produce the 10 dimensional Hitorati EA times EA string theory from the domain of 11 dimensional M theory, and also his proposal on Lipschitz gravity theory. He will be speaking about his recent work, series of works on topological quantum gravity and the Ricci flow. And this will be the part one of his lecture. Next Wednesday will be part two. I would like to encourage the audience, please feel free to interact with Professor Hojava if you have questions or if you. If you want to, uh, if you want to ask something for more details, so let's directly welcome uh, Professor Hojava. So yours, take over. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here, at least virtually, uh, visiting Harvard and addressing such a distinguished audience. Um, my talk will be interdisciplinary, somewhere between physics and math, even though I'm primarily a physicist. So hopefully uh, this will be an interesting topic for both sides of the, of the spectrum. And uh, I will also encourage everyone to ask questions if anything is unclear or you have comments, please feel free to interrupt at any time. So the topic is going to be our recent work on topological quantum gravity of the Ricci flow. And that's an attempt to connect three different areas of physics and math. It's based on my work with my, my former undergraduate student, Alex Franco, who is now a graduate student at Harvard, oh, sorry, at Stanford, and Stephen Randall, my former graduate student. It's based on three papers listed here, published a year and a half ago. And uh, in the first paper, we tried to formulate a topological quantum gravity theory using a path integral formulation built such that it localizes the path integral to the solutions of the famous Ricci flow equations, which have been so prominent in pure mathematics over the past 20 years or more. In the second paper, we clarified the gauge symmetries of the theory we constructed in paper one. And in the third paper, we finally made precise relationship, precise contact with Perelman's version of the Ricci flow and found how that partic particular set of equations is embedded into our topological quantum gravity. So the main idea, again, as I said, is to connect three previously disconnected areas of physics and mathematics. One of them is topological quantum field theory. Many of you are familiar with many beautiful examples. The story goes back to 1988, at least. You'll be interested in a specific class of topological quantum field theories, those that are of the cohomological type. Those are the ones that require for their construction of a meaningful path integral the BRST cohomological construction and techniques. The typical example of such a topological quantum field theory of the cohomological type is Witten's original topological four-dimensional Yang-Mills theory, which is built around the solutions of the instanton equations and localizes the path integral to the moduli space of instantons. And of course, we all know how influential that particular construction has been over the decades now uh, in influencing both physics and mathematics. Uh, many beautiful results have been established on the mathematical side as a consequence of proposals and conjectures made by the physicists. So uh, this is a very fruitful area of physics or, and, and mathematics, which certainly deserves to be even further enhanced. So our attempt is to combine this idea of cohomological type quantum field theories with quantum gravity and Ricci flows. So the mathematics of the Ricci flows, that's of course a fascinating subject in pure mathematics based on the original work by Hamilton and others, and then primarily stimulated by the developments in the early 21st century due to Grisha Perelman's work, where it turned out that it has been possible to use a slightly tweaked, modified 
Ricci flow to prove the Poincaré conjecture and uh, many other consequences have followed. So this really triggered a, an avalanche of mathematical investigations. There have been multi-volume textbooks written on the subject of the Ricci flows. So it's really a very rich area of mathematics and I would love to be able to borrow some of those beautiful mathematical results and input them into the physics of quantum gravity. So that's one of the motivations that the many beautiful and conclusive results that have been accumulated, many detailed results about the structure of Ricci flows in various dimensions, in particular in dimension three in space. Those, those beautiful mathematical results are so exciting because potentially they can shed light on the ideas of path integral methods in quantum gravity, which is a subject which we physicists are very much interested in. And we are still very much learning how to properly approach and define path integrals in quantum gravity in the presence of diffeomorphism symmetries. So hopefully the mathematical results can be eventually, once we make contact between the topological quantum field theory part and the mathematical side imported into the physics and uh, um, can shed some new light on the gravitational path integral. What kind of quantum gravity we'll be discussing, and that's the third topic that will be connected to the first two. It's a specific, relatively recent uh, version of quantum gravity that is not exhibiting the full relativistic symmetries of Einstein's general relativity. Instead, it lives on manifolds with foliations. In particular, there are versions of the theory where time plays a preferred role. So in that sense, this version of quantum gravity, it does describe the dynamics of a space-time metric, but it does not put diffeomorphism invariance of the full space-time as one of the fundamental principles. Instead, it's a non-relativistic version of gravity. And that could be a very interesting branch of quantum gravity on its own for several reasons. And I'll comment on each of these three topics individually at first. So at the beginning of this first lecture, I'll be explaining in more detail each of these individual three topics so that we have some background before we can start connecting them to each other. And I expect that once we connect these three topics, it will be interesting both for physicists and for mathematicians. It's certainly going to be interesting for physicists precisely because of the wealth of mathematical results <coughs> accumulated in the, <coughs> in the theory of the Ricci flow over the past two decades or more. And I'm hopeful that it will be also useful for mathematicians in the similar sense in which the four dimensional topological Yagnos <coughs> theory has been useful for generating new invariants for manifolds um, through physical observables. So we'll be at some point interested in studying what kind of observables uh, can be defined in our topological version of quantum gravity of the Ricci flow and what kind of correlation functions one can calculate in the path integral. And that might be of interest to pure mathem mathem mathematical side of the, of the story. Okay, so let's begin. Uh, I have a naive question. Yes. Right. So is the first T of T example is a unitary theory or is not unitary? Um, as a physical theory, this would be a unitary theory. Uh, I mean, you can construct this non-relativistic version of quantum gravity in various ways and then impose the condition of unitarity to constrain the uh, values of the coupling constants that um, are present in the Lagrangian that satisfies the certain symmetries. In the topological setting, this will be a theory which ends up having no local degrees of freedom, just like topological Yang-Mills has no propagating gluons. It only contains the cohomological information containing the BRST cohomology. Uh, similarly, this non-relativistic topological gravity also is empty of gravitons even though the path integral does contain the gravitational field, um, it doesn't propagate local degrees of freedom. So unitarity is of very limited um, usefulness in that context. The theory is well-defined as a theory of correlation functions of these cohomological global observables in principle. Okay. And right. can I also make sure, so the, the formulation you have, can I regard some quantum path integral formulation of a uh, 
Hamiltonian, uh, Hamilton Perelman Richard Flow theory, because they are doing something more classical. So you are doing a quantum passing version of that. Is there something? Yes, I, my intention is precisely, and I'm uh, now getting ahead of ourselves a little bit. The intention is to construct a quantum field theory of the fluctuating metric in space time in such a way that the path integral will localize to the solutions of the classical Ricci flow equations. Just like the path integral in topological Yang Mills localizes the path integral to the moduli space of instant terms of Yang Mills, the same will happen here with the classical Ricci flow equations. So, in that sense, the classical solutions dominate the path integral and the semi classical path integral uh, becomes exact uh, in principle as a, as a one loop exact semi classical mm -hmm. path integral localized to the classical solutions. Okay, so, thank you. And, so, and the last one is yes, if, sorry, just that it's no, a no. non relativistic gravity there. The, the third, third topic yes. is, is an option or is a, is a, is a inevitable or uh, inevitable root that there must be the non-relativistic gravity. Just make sure, can there be some other type of gravity theory? Well, is that, we'll, we'll see that, that the, the, the symmetries of the Ricci flow, there's a certain scaling property behind the Ricci flows as written. You could of course try to modify the Ricci flow and start playing various games, changing the number of derivatives that, that appear on the right-hand side. But if you take the classic Hamilton or Perelman type Ricci flow, it automatically implies an anisotropy between time and space. And that will naturally lead us to the anisotropic versions of gravity that are known as Lipschitz type quantum gravity theories. And they're def definitely inherently non relativistic. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's begin on the mathematical side a little bit. I apologize that I'm not an expert by any stretch on the beautiful results of the Ricci flow. I'm only skimming the surface of what the mathematicians have accomplished. So let's begin with the most rudimentary Ricci flow. And that was the one that was very much popularized by Hamilton in the, starting in the eighties, uh, in particular in the connection to solving various topological problems, including uh, the ambitious project of solving the, answering the Poincare conjecture. So let's set some conventions here. I'll be using a very pedestrian notation. Uh, I'll be using essentially the uh, Penrose abstract index notation. So Gij is a spatial metric which depends on spatial coordinates xk. So I'm starting on some spatial manifold sigma of dimension d. The dimension will be a free parameter. We will be able to construct in principle this theory in any dimension, but then of course in specific dimensions the uh, properties of the quantum theory will be more easily controllable. So for example, two plus one space-time dimensions and three plus one sp space-time dimensions will play a special role. But for the time being, let's keep the dimension uh, arbitrary and let's try to construct at least at first a classical Lagrangian that satisfies certain symmetries and then we can input it into the path integral and ask what the quantum theory looks like in various dimensions. So the index i always goes over the d spatial dimensions. Time plays a special role. So I can think of this full space time as a d plus one dimensional manifold. And for simplicity, I'll be assuming until forced to do otherwise that the space time is of a direct topological product structure, sigma d cross a time interval. And we'll be studying the bulk properties uh, not yet paying attention to boundary conditions at the beginning or the end of time. So at first we'll be studying this equation for the time derivative of the metric being set by the Ricci tensor. Clearly this is already showing an, an isotropy between time and space because the left-hand side contains one time derivative, the right-hand side contains two spatial derivatives and therefore there is an anisotropy measured by what a physicist would call a dynamical critical exponent equal, equal to two. Relativistic systems automatically have dynamical critical exponents equal to one. So this is clearly a non-relativistic flow equation. And that will lead us, as I mentioned earlier, to embedding it into a non-relativistic version of quantum gravity. So the, the original Hamilton flow was very interesting, but also uh, suffers from various drawbacks. In particular, the right-hand side of the flow equation is not derivable from a variational principle. 
Uh, if you replace the right hand side with the Einstein tensor uh, of general relativity, that would be derivable, of course, from a variational principle, but that would not lead to interesting good physical prop mathematical properties of the flow. So uh, in order to resolve this particular issue and for other reasons as well, in the early 21st century, Grisha Perelman proposed a slightly modified version of the Ricci flow. Uh, and he was actually inspired in string theory, uh, even though as we will see the embedding that we will find uh, is a very different type of embedding of the Ricci flow into physics. He was very much inspired by the uh, Warchid beta function equations in uh, string theory uh, where the space-time metric is uh, running with the randomization group flow and the running of the geometry is controlled by the Ricci, uh, Ricci tensor. In, in string theory, the space-time metric is often equipped also with a partner called the dilaton, which is a space-time scalar field and the flow of the randomization group controls both the change of the space-time metric or spatial metric and the flow of the dilaton. So there is a combined pairing of the flow of a scalar together with a spatial metric. And Perelman very much liked this particular combination of flows for various reasons. Of course, primarily because it allowed him to control various uh, monotonic behaved quantities uh, towards the proof of the Poincaré conjecture. But also this uh, flow satisfies some very intriguing properties. In particular, it's derivable from a variational principle, but it is also by a specific simple trick related to the original Hamilton equation, hamilton ricci flow. In particular, there is a trick called the Turks trick, which was designed here in Berkeley at MSRI and uh, the idea was that you can certainly apply spatial diffeomorphisms to the uh, two sides of the flow. And if you pick the spatial diffeomorphism to be generated by the derivative of the gelatin itself, after applying the spatial diffeomorphism to both sides of the equation, you decouple, in a sense, the flow of the metric from the flow of the gelatin in this uh, particular form. So you end up producing the first equation, which is essentially equivalent to the original Hamilton equation. Plus, you have to decide how to solve the remaining equation for the dilaton itself. So there is a relation between these two flows, but we'll be primarily interested in Perelman's version because it has better properties and it's derivable, at least its right-hand side is derivable from a path in, from a variational principle. To a physicist, the question would be, if I insist that the right-hand side be derivable from a variational principle. Shouldn't I also expect that the, that the left-hand side of the flow be derivable from a variational principle? And that will definitely be a part of our story because we'll be trying to embed these equations into a theory defined with a space-time action where both spatial and time derivatives will appear, not just the spatial part that governs the right-hand side of the equation. But the spatial part that governs the right-hand side of the equation was certainly shown by Perelman to be derivable, as I said, from a variational principle, but it's a slightly subtle variational principle. So the idea is the following. Uh, you define what Perelman called the F-functional. It's a simple expression recognizable to a quantum field theorist or a string theorist as the most natural leading set of terms that you would to govern the dynamics of a metric and a scalar field. And then there is a possibility of having a prefactor here, which in Perman's case is just e to the minus phi in front of both of these terms. In general, you can ask whether more general functions should be allowed in a quantum setting, but we will not be asking this question yet. So we just postulate this simple functional and then we perform the variation of the metric and the scalar field, but not just an arbitrary variation. We constrain following in Perelman's footsteps, we constrain the variations so that the, the measure defined here is held fixed in time. Once you put in this additional constraint, then you vary the func F functional and you find the right-hand side of Perelman's flow equation. So this will play a role 
uh, certainly this f functional will be looking for a good place where this should appear in physics, in our topological theory, and we'll find that in fact, again, we'll see this in more detail, the f functional will play the role of the superpotential in our construction of this supersymmetric topological version of quantum gravity. The supersymmetry in question is related to the BRST symmetries of the cohomological type that I mentioned earlier. So that's why su supersymmetry of a certain kind, a non-relativistic version of supersymmetry will play a central role in the construction. But the question will be, if this F plays the role of the superpotential, where is this constraint coming from? If we don't find a good place for this constraint, then we are not making contact with Perelman's version of the Ricci flow. And it will be very intriguing to see where this constraint comes from. It almost looks like the constraint might be a partial gauge fixing of some space-time gauge symmetries. That was our suspicion at first, but in the end, that's not how it uh, is implemented. It will be implemented in the Lifshitz type quantum gravity in a very interesting way that has to do with the existence of two competing inequivalent types of kinetic terms in Lifshitz gravity. So I'll show you perhaps in lecture two. I'm not sure if in lecture one we'll get all the way to explaining this precise connection to Perelman. Chances are in lecture one we'll construct the broader class of topological quantum gravities um, step by step. And once we get there, then we can ask where is the precise connection with exact equations of Perelman's. Uh, excuse me. Yes. Um, what's the interpretation of the M over there on the right hand side? Well, that's just the definition of a measure. So I'm just saying this, this was the original notation. You can say the left hand side is a measure which is independent of time. That's the constraint. Okay. And this is just a notation for, for that measure. No problem. Okay. So again, I'm not. Um, in a position to review all the important consequences of the Ricci flow for mathematics. I'm just mentioning a few fascinating consequences that have been extracted from studying the Ricci flow. Uh, I'm leaving it certainly to the experts to um, summarize, if necessary, what uh, kind of usefulness they find in the Ricci flow. Um, why is it interesting for physics? That's a question which I can ad address, at least to some extent. And I already mentioned how difficult it is for us to put enough uh, detail behind the idea of the path integral in the presence of gravitational fluctuations. It's much easier to make sense of various path integral methods in non-gravitational quantum field theories on rigid, rigid fixed space times. But the question of uh, the full precise definition or structure of the path integral in the presence of fluctuating geometries is still very much up in the air and has been studied in various toy examples and baby examples in low enough dimensions with few degrees of freedom. And we are still learning a lot. And we are learning a lot about how these path integrals are related to various concepts of entropy. Uh, entropy is a particular catchphrase that Perelman has used quite a lot in the context of the Ricci flow. So there is uh, a good sense in which a technical notion of entropy shows up in that context. And it will be fascinating to see whether we can import that mathematical version of Perelman's entropy into learning about space times with uh, topology changes, which is exactly what happens on the mathematical side, as we'll see when the Ricci flow starts, you are often forced into allowing a surgery on the spatial manifold leading to a topology change. Those have been processes that physicists have expected for a long time to be present in quantum gravity. So if we can borrow, borrow the results from the mathematicians and control in a well-defined setting of a path integral for a controllable topological version of quantum gravity, we can control potentially this topology changing process. That would be a fascinating advancement, at least a small step towards uh, improving our understanding of the gravitational path integral. So let me give you, to, to those of you who may not be familiar with uh, the intuition behind the Ricci flow, let's look at a few very simple examples just to build some intuition. So if you start with the Ricci flat manifold, like I, here I just illustrated by a torus, it just sits there and stays 
intact for all eternity. If you start with a manifold which has positive curvature, typically what happens, it may start inhomogeneous or anisotropic, and then it rounds itself. So it becomes smoother and smoother, more symmetric. And then it collapses typically to a point at one instant in time. So there is a, an extinction singularity that this leads to in finite time. Uh, on the other hand, if you have a hyperbolic space, then it typically just expands uh, and maybe again, there's some uh, smoothing out of certain re regions, but also the creation of singularities can happen at, fin at finite time. So one particular singularity that can happen, which is very interesting and certainly leads to uh, a topology change, which in the mathematical literature is handled uh, in Perelman's words by studying Ricci flow with surgery. Uh, if you start with a deformed uh, sphere, uh, intuitively like a dumbbell type shaped uh, geometry, what happens is that the more round parts uh, round themselves just like in the previous case for the more round sphere on the previous transparency. But the, the place where the original sphere has been kind of pinched, the pinching uh, gets more and more intense and at some point uh, collapses the geometry. And then you have to decide some epsilon away before this collapse happens, how to restart the flow some epsilon after. So that was Perelman's original strategy to follow the flow to some time epsilon before this topology change and then performing a surgery and restarting the flow with the surgically altered uh, spatial geometry. And then this was a, a very pragmatic technique that was used uh, in Perelman's original work. The, the work of uh, many uh, more recent um, Ritchie flow investigations, work of people like Lott or Bamler have shown that this can be even improved. There's a, a better definition in the mathematical literature due to these people now that allows us to control and define this not just with some cutoff of epsilon before and epsilon after the topology change, but to go through the precise topology change on the mathematical side. Um, so in the process of figuring out how this topology changes here, what we have done intuitively was to zoom in on the shorter, shorter and shorter distances, kind of ignoring the outside of the geometry away from this topology change. So in the intuitive sense of the renormalization group, what you're effectively doing, you are trying to zoom in on the shortest distance uh, region near the, the singularity where the topology changes. So this leads to a very precise mathematical construction modeling the singularities. And this is also where many fascinating results have been accumulated over the past 20 or more years, especially in three spatial dimensions. So what you do when you try to zoom in closer and closer to the singularity, what you find is a theorem, which essentially says that these types of singularities can be modeled by geometries, which effectively factorize into all the interesting stuff happening in two dimensions while the third spatial dimension is just a spectator. So in, in many ways, these topology changing processes are effectively two dimensional. All, all the important stuff happens in two dimensions. In this particular case for the neck pinch, and this is true in three dimensions. Um, to some extent, this is controllable in higher dimensions as well, but it's certainly in three dimensions, there is a full classification of what kind of possible singularity models can occur for topology changing processes. So that's fascinating to me. This means basically that in three dimensions, the mathematicians have already classified fully what can happen for any arbitrarily complicated initial spatial metric as it evolves under the Ricci flow. And I would love to take advantage of these results in the physics path integral context. So this topic of this effective two dimensional reduction of the important dynamics near the singularities, this will come back uh, towards the end of our second lecture when we'll be discussing whether the topological quantum gravity as a quantum field theory can be UV complete, whether it represents a, a theory which provides its own short distance completion. Is it a renormalizable theory? 
if it's not a renormalizable theory, can we define it in some other ways where, where we can provide a non-perturbative definition that would be good up to arbitrary short scales in the geometry. So remember, this is a theory, this will be a theory of a space-time metric. So there are scales in the, in the problem. It's not a topological theory where everything will just depend on topology without any metric information, but there are no local propagating gravitons. Local fluctuations are not physical. Only the global metric of the Ricci flow solutions will be uh, a part of the dynamics of the theory. So now to the second topic, or actually this is what I listed as number three on the list, gravity with an isotropic scaling or non-relativistic gravity. So forget topological questions and mathematics. This is a part of, is there a raised hand? Yeah, in case, I just want to make sure is the previous slide, these techniques of uh, maybe reducing one dimension that you say about singularity, etc. That should, should you also apply to other dimension other than 3D to 2D? Just make sure. There are, there are partial results in dimension three, but certainly dimension three uh, is studied. To, to my understanding, there is a full classification of all possible singularities that, that can happen in three dimensions. And with the exception of those complete extinction events like here and here, those that lead to topology change as opposed to extinction, they all exhibit this effective reduction to the dynamics happening in two dimensions with the third one being a spectator. Um, in dimensions higher than three, there are partial results, but I don't think the full classifications are available. Uh, perhaps the next interesting example is four spa spatial dimensions with a Keller structure. So there would be a complex version of the flow where you, you assume that the uh, the spatial manifold is a two-dimensional complex manifold, so four-dimensional uh, real manifold with a complex structure. And then you can study uh, Keller-Ricci Keller flows. And there has been a lot of progress on that topic as well. But three dimensions certainly play a special role. Two dimensions are kind of too simple in many ways, even though they do provide a new proof of the uniformization uh, theorem for classification of Riemann surfaces. So this is a new proof, which uh, is not requiring some um, additional assumptions of previous proofs. But the theory is very simple in two dimensions, almost too simple. Uh, in three dimensions, that's the exciting uh, part that the mathematicians have studied in, in most detail. And higher dimensions are somewhat studied, but nowhere near as, as much as three and two dimensions. And also another question about the surgery. I wonder what the surgery procedure we will require. For example, some of the surgery might be as simple as cut out some submanifold and then cut it out and then re-glue it back by mapping class group of the, the boundary. Yeah. So but, but what are the surgery that you require? Maybe more than this? So are there just what are, what are the type of surgery? Um, this is, this is very much connected to the uh, mathematical theory of surgery like you can find in Wall's textbook or uh, other places like that where you you basically take a, a sphere of a certain dimension across an interval and replace it with um, higher dimensional disks with that same boundary so that's that's the, the dominant topology change that's uh, playing a role so here you would have and if you are in three dimensions this might be an s2 cross a, an interval and you're replacing it with three dimensional disks Okay, and what, so, what are the surgery we require in, in your lecture? Maybe later, I just get a sense. Uh, I'm just, I'm just, uh, stay, I'm not going to use the surgery. Uh -huh. I'm just going to borrow the results if necessary. But we, as, as you will see, we'll be spending most of both lectures, both today and next time, constructing the path integral. Uh, first by constructing the action that satisfies certain symmetries and deciding what kind of gauge symmetries we require. So we'll be mostly studying the flow before we hit any singularities. Uh, and the idea is that the singularities have been studied by mathematicians, but for a physicist, we first need to understand the path integral in the bulk and then see how to approach the existence of the singularity. So the singularity studies would be 
perhaps for the future. It's not something that we have addressed in any detail in, in our work so far. Okay, thanks. So now I would like to review a little bit this idea of gravity with anisotropic scaling or Lifshitz type gravity. Um, again, there are various different motivations why you would be interested in this. One motivation might be uh, perhaps it's too soon to say that our universe has to be described by gravity, which is absolutely relativistic up to arbitrarily high energies. Maybe that's uh, too ambitious for us to say. So if we can mathematically construct a consistent theory of gravity, which treats time and space at short distances anisotropically, perhaps we should, and we should explore whether that might be a, an alternative candidate for describing the real world. But even with a much less ambition, it's interesting to construct this theory because it might provide new techniques. It might not describe the universe as we observe it, <clears throat> but it might describe new types of gravity duals for a broader class of holographic dualities. So you can find perhaps that some quantum field theories have a holographic dual, which is described by a non-relativistic version of gravity. And if that's the case, we should by all means study those and see what we can learn about the dual quantum field theories. So there are at least those two motivations. <clears throat> and of course, the connection to the Ricci flow provides a third motivation. So what is gravity with anisotropic scaling? Well, first of all, what is anisotropic scaling? Uh, I can illustrate in just flat Minkowski spacetime. So let's fix the metric of spacetime for the moment, make it flat, and then you can start study rescalings of Cartesian coordinates of space and time and allow an isotropic scaling under the renormalization group scaling transformation. Maybe some physical systems behave such that they exhibit a non-trivial dynamical critical exponent that indeed happens in many places in condensed matter physics, in non-equilibrium statistical mechanics, many other places outside of relativistic particle physics or quantum gravity. And these are very interesting quantum field theories. The dynamical exponent is a very important measurable quantity. Uh, there are various systems which have integer values of this dynamical exponent. Relativistic systems automatically have z equal to one. But there are also known examples, such as the uh, Kardar Parisi Zhang surface growth problem in one dimension that has an exactly calculable dynamical critical exponent equal to three halves. So fractions can happen. It, essentially any z greater than zero shows up somewhere in some mathematical constructions of some consistent quantum field theories with anisotropic scaling. So since this is such a useful concept in so many areas of physics, why ignore it when you're interested in quantum gravity? And indeed, this is what uh, triggered in 2008 or nine, a lot of interest in this an isotropic version of quantum gravity. In particular, you can have propagating gravitons, which are gapless excitations, just like in relativistic theories. There are now physical propagating degrees of freedom. So I'm not talking about a topological theory at this moment. I'm just saying you can certainly start with the same space-time metric that uh, enters into Einstein's general relativity and postulate the dynamics which will exhibit this type of anisotropic scaling. So what does that buy us? That might buy us something very interesting. In particular, we all know how difficult it has been over the many decades to construct a full, consistent, complete theory of quantum gravity in four dimensions. The naive Einstein uh, Lagrangian is not leading to a renormalizable quantum field theory. And uh, on the other hand, in contrast, some of these non-relativistic theories because of the anisotropic scaling at shortest distances might become uh, renormalizable in interesting physical dimensions in two plus one or in three plus one. And in particular, uh, they might provide new ways of completing quantum gravity theories at short distances. The burden would then be, if you want to compare this to the real universe, uh, how do you explain that the low energy physics of gravity is so highly relativistic. So the relativistic symmetries in this picture, if they emerge at all, would be emergent at short, um, at, at low, low energies. And uh, the anisotropy would kick in only at very high energies, perhaps those energies that are not yet observable uh, in our experiments. So that would be the scenario. 
Let's illustrate the anisotropic scaling by a simple example of a scalar field, just to get some feel for anisotropic scaling. I can postulate a Lagrangian for a single scalar field phi, such that it will have two time derivatives on the same footing as four spatial derivatives. Here, delta is a spatial Laplacian operator in D dimensions. And this is an example of a system uh, which has a critical dynamical exponent equal to two. The anisotropy between time and space is such that two spatial derivatives are for dimensional counting worth one time derivative. So z is equal to two. It's a free field theory, but it will have interesting relevant deformations and interacting terms that you can start adding and you can start building using the usual techniques and uh, usual logic of effective field theory, you can start building renormalization group flows in the space of such theories. And you can look for interesting fixed points of the renormalization group and various flows between them. So in contrast to a Euclidean field theory, if I have a Euclidean relativistic invariant d-dimensional theory described by this simple Lagrangian, the field little phi is automatically of scaling dimension classically d minus two over two. So something special happens in two dimensions for the relativistic theory. And we all know what that is. The theory becomes very rich in two dimensions. It leads to an infinite number of classically marginal couplings that represent the target space metric and the randomization group flows are very famous from string theory and control how Einstein's equations can be derived from the vanishing of the beta function in nonlinear sigma models in relativistic two dimensions. In contrast, our example of a Lipschitz scalar, the capital phi field, will have the dimension equal to capital D minus two divided by two. So the spatial dimension minus two divided by two. It's dimensionless when D is equal to two. So this is two plus one non-relativistic dimensions. And the same will be true for this scalar capital phi, the Lipschitz scalar that we claimed was true for the relativistic field in two dimensions. In two plus one dimensions, this field phi will formally lead to an infinite number of classically marginal couplings representing uh, target space metrics. In fact, there will be at least two metrics uh, one associated with the kinetic term, one with the, sp the spatial uh, derivative term. And uh, there will be a more complicated pattern of renormalization group flows, which mimics what happens in string theory, but the underlying theory resides on a two plus one dimensional uh, word volume, so to speak. So this is no longer connected to string theory. It would be connected at best to some non-relativistic membrane. So this is an example of how, first of all, the critical dimensions when you go from isotropic scaling to anisotropic scaling, they shift. So instead of the system being in a critical dimension in two, as in the relativistic case, it goes to the critical dimension two plus one. So it's, it's really an interesting shift in where the theory has the richest structure. And you can anticipate that the same will be happening for gravity as well. So let's construct a gravity version of such a Lipschitz type anisotropic scaling theory. And this is going to be important uh, for setting our notation for the rest of the lectures. So let's spend some time discussing the details of this. So first of all, I'm going to be assuming that there is a preferred foliation topologically, not, not geometrically yet. I'm just saying our space-time is a foliated manifold. It's a differentiable manifold with a foliation structure. There'll be leaves of constant time. So this is going to be a co-dimension one foliation uh, this is interesting for quantum gravity for another reason that there is a notorious problem uh, in conventional relativistic quantum gravity, how to uh, reconcile the notion of time in general relativity, where it's very different from the quantum mechanical notion of time, how to reconcile it with quantum mechanics. This problem has been largely eliminated conceptually by assuming this foliation structure. So this non-relativistic gravity theory might be much more uh, amenable to a uh, promotion to a quantum theory than conventional general relativity. But regardless of that motivation, it would, it would just postulate the space-time structure to be that of a foliated manifold. This will, of course, show up when we try to later make contact with the Ricci flow, because Ricci flows also effectively 
uh, deal with manifolds which have a preferred foliation by spatial slices, parametrized by the evolution of global time. So what is our, our next step? Once we specify the underlying topological structure of space-time, we need to define what our dynamical fields will be. And I'm going to postulate that, that the fields for us right now uh, will be just a space-time metric. But the space-time metric will be written in the so-called ADM decomposition, a Hamiltonian type decomposition where we split the, four dim the D, D plus one dimensional space-time metric into the spatial metric. Again, the indices i, j go over spatial values. And uh, the off-diagonal piece of the D plus one dimensional space-time metric is going to be called the shift vector. And then there is the lapse function, which is roughly speaking related to the square root of the inverse time-time um, com component of the inverse metric. So this is just the same four-dimensional four metric if we are in four space-time dimensions, except it would be decomposed into a three-dimensional spatial metric plus a scalar plus a vector. And that decomposition is, of course, famous throughout general relativity. But here we will use it without assuming diffeomorphism invariance. Is there a question? Yeah, can I ask a question? Absolutely. Um, the fact that you foliate space in leaves of constant time, Physically, would that mean that uh, time has like a, un a smallest unit that you can have, whereas space is continuous? Is there a way to sort of bypass this issue of time and have a continuous time instead? Uh, there is certainly a continu continuous time. The, the manifold is a D plus one dimensional smooth manifold, and uh, it has been foliated into a smooth collection of leaves. So there is no discretization of time. Time is, is still a continuous parameter, except there is a preferred co-dimension one foliation, which you can label the leaves of the foliation by giving them a smooth time coordinate, time label. So time can go from some initial to some final time through all the real values. And those real values label the indi individual leaves. Could this uh, foliation be instead be done in some spatial dimension, which could maybe make sense in, in some kind of more applied scenarios? That's, that's an excellent question. Uh, we've spent a lot of time entertaining various uh, multiple foliations and spatial anisotropies. I'm here focusing only on the simplest example because that's the one relevant for the Ricci flow. Where we will not be a priori assuming any anisotropy or uh, scaling that distinguishes a special dimension of space, although that is possible and there are interesting generalizations of this gravity theory where you have multiple foliations where even the spatial dimensions uh, scale anisotropically, anisotropically with respect to each other. But it will be outside of uh, what I'll be covering in these lectures. Thanks. So we, ha so we have these fields, which are basically just a space-time metric written in variables that are useful from the perspective of that foliation. The next step in the construction is to postulate symmetries. Gauge symmetries will be not all space-time diffeomorphisms, but only foliation-preserving diffeomorphisms. Again, this is consistent with our assumption that the uh, preferred foliation is a part of the physical definition of the theory. And once you specify symmetries and fields, then everything follows just the logic of effective field theory. You can start constructing actions that uh, satisfy the symmetries, and you can split the action into the part that does contain time derivatives versus the part that does not contain time derivatives. And that's my definition of SK for kinetic and SV for potential term. So the kinetic term, which is analogous, if you go back to our previous example, we are now constructing the analog of the phi dot squared term of the scalar field. And later on, the potential piece will be the generalization of the spatial derivative part of the, of the action. So for the kinetic term, you can, if you postulate time reversal invariance in the, in the system, then you, you can have two, two types of kinetic terms. First of all, we construct a fancified version of the time derivative of the spatial metric. Fancified here means technically it has been made covariant under those diffeomorphisms that preserve the foliation by being decorated by one over n and these 
uh, derivatives of the shift vector. So this makes things covariant under the gauge symmetry. This is also the second fundamental form of the spatial slices inside the space-time picture. So this Kij, you can think of as the natural generalization of the time derivative of the spatial metric. And now, unlike in the case of the scalar field, where there's only one possible kinetic term, and unlike in general relativity, where there is only one specific combination of terms that satisfies diffeomorphism invariance, here in non-relativistic gravity theories, we have two different independent kinetic terms. One of them is Kij, Kij, and uh, I'll normalize the coefficient here to be one so that I pull out an overall coupling, one over kappa squared. And then there's another kinetic term where I take first the trace of K with respect to the metric and square the trace. Historically, the coefficient in front of this relative to that term is called little lambda, and that will be the notation that I'll be using throughout. So the point is the kinetic term with the minimum number of two time derivatives. This is also useful for unitarity reasons. We don't want to start with higher time derivative Lagrangians because you might get into trouble explaining how that's a unitary theory. So here we'll be assuming that we are only allowing two time derivatives in the kinetic term, but we'll find these two independent kinetic terms. So this parameter lambda together with this coupling kappa represents an important coupling constant in the theory. And we'll see later on how in making connection with the Perelman flow, uh, lambda will play a very crucial role. We'll be taking lambda to a very special value in order to make contact in our topological quantum gravity with the precise Perelman version of the Ricci flow. But for now, lambda is an arbitrary real coupling constant. It might be constrained in these theories to lie within a certain range by perturbative unitarity conditions, but in general, it's a, it's a free parameter. When, once you quantize this theory, then of course, both lambda and kappa in principle will be running coupling constants that will depend on the scale. And it would be fascinating to study in more detail the pattern of renormalization group flows. And there have been various groups who've uh, actually studied this version of quantum gravity in low enough dimensions like two plus one and they have argued that various versions of this theory can actually be asymptotically free. So this is an interesting setting for probing quantum gravity using conventional methods of quantum field theory and randomization group flow. So the next step to construct the theory is to construct the candidate potential piece, which is built out of covariant derivatives and the Riemann tensor. And you get to choose how many spatial derivatives you wish to add. You want to start organizing things from the lowest number of derivatives and start adding higher and higher derivatives. But then at some point you perhaps stop once you reach to a level where the theory might be power countingly normalizable depending on what space-time dimension you are in. So there are lots of choices in this potential, but of course, as usual in effective field theory, every term that's consistent with the symmetries should be a priori included in the construction. And it's not up to us to decide which we allow, it's up to the randomization group flow to decide which ones are there and which ones are, are irrelevant. So there is one important dichotomy for these oh, theories. Excuse yes. me. Yes. yes. So uh, about the previous slide, uh -huh. just make sure the previous one. Yes, so the action, you have two terms, Kij, K up Ij, and uh, minus lambda K square. Uh -huh. So I wonder for the like Riemann tensor, I think you can also write some term, some term like a trace R wage R. Are there a similar term for this theory? Yeah, so I'm not even writing the proliferation of terms that would show up in the potential piece. Uh, we might return to this in, in a moment, but uh, you certainly can combine any contractions of indices that work as long as V ends up being a scalar so that you can integrate it against this space-time density. Uh, any such term should be allowed and uh, you'll organize them by how many derivatives they have. So the lowest term might be just a constant, the cosmological constant. Then the next term would be the unique spatial scalar curvature term. And then it gets more complicated. Once you look at terms with three or four derivatives, you might have things like the square of the Riemann tensor, 
or the square of the Ricci tensor or the square of the Ricci scalar. And those will be independent terms in high enough dimensions. So the number of independent terms grows very thick, quickly with the number of derivatives that you allow. But that's exactly what makes the theory interesting that once you allow more spatial derivatives, you might end up constructing a power counting normalizable theory, let's say in three plus one space time dimensions. So for that, you would need the dynamical exponents equal to three. So the, the terms uh, in this potential should have up to six derivatives. And you have to, again, classify all possible such terms in order to make sure that the theory can be self-contained under a normalization. I see. Yeah, I, I, let me just clarify my question. I, I think I'm asking that uh, there are terms similar, like for young minor theory, you can also a the theta term, trace at Voyager F. Oh. For the Riemann, Riemann tensor or Riemann yes. curvature tool form, you have a trace at Voyager. That's oh, related to the signature, signature four manifold and also Pontryangian class. And I wonder whether those K can read also has some term like that. Maybe, maybe you can, maybe you can not. I just wonder whether there are such terms you can write. These are different. There are certainly topological invariants that you can construct out of the Riemann tensor, and they will be playing the role of theta angles. Uh, so for now, we are just constructing a local theory, not yet uh, worrying about global topology effects. Uh, but when you try to construct the full structure, you would, of course, want to take care of these topological terms and allow them to be added correctly to the theory, just like in the case of yang mills But again, the story is much more complex compared to yang mills There are many more terms in interesting enough dimensions. So this analysis has not been, of course, yet pushed as far as in the case of the yang mills Thank you. So now we have to make a distinction between two different versions of the theory. One is simpler, but it will also be less relevant for our Ricci flow problem. Uh, that is called the projectable theory because the diffeomorphisms that preserve the foliation of space-time, they are locally generated by space-time dependent, dependent spatial diffeomorphisms, but the only time-dependent time diffeomorphisms. So consistently with these symmetries, one can observe that N and Ni are effectively playing the role of the gauge fields associated with those two gauge symmetries. So Ni, the the spatial shift vector is essentially transforming under spatial diffeomorphism as a gauge field of the diffeomorphism. N is transforming as a gauge field of this time reparametrization. And therefore, because the time reparametrization is only dependent on T, not on X, we can consistently constrain N, the, the lapse function, to be only a function of time. This is known in the theory of foliated manifolds as a projectable field a field that depends only on the parameter of the leaves and not on the location along the leaves. So if we make N the lapse function projectable, uh, this is consistent with everything we know about quantization and leads to a simpler version of the theory known as the projectable theory. On the other hand, we can also freely allow N to be a space-time field. This is going to be the case which will be directly relevant for our topological quantum gravity construction. And in that case, once N is a space-time field, we'll end up having an additional ingredient which can enter into the construction, oops, construction of Lagrangians. So instead of just having the spatial derivatives of the metric leading to the Riemann tensor and, and, and so on, derivatives of the Riemann tensor, powers of the Riemann tensor, we'll also have a spatial derivative of the non-projectable laps, in, in particular, partial i n divided by n transforms as a vector on space under these diffeomorphism uh, symmetries. And therefore, you can construct new ingredients in the, in the Lagrangian using this derivative of the lapse. This will be very important for our connection to Perelman. So then you quantize this theory, and then you find that the perturbative spectrum around flat space-time uh, contains propagating gravitons and the dispersion relation is controlled by how many uh, derivatives you have allowed in the spatial part of the Lagrangian. And unitarity perturbatively puts some constraints on the value of this little lambda parameter, which was so important uh, in the kinetic term. By the way, if you go back to this kinetic term, you can ask, what if I enhance the gauge symmetries so that it involves all space-time diffeomorphisms? Then you end up, end up constructing uniquely the Einstein-Hilbert Lagrangian, which also has a decomposition like this into the time derivative pieces 
and a spatial derivative pieces. In that particular case, the value of lambda is frozen to be exactly one by the space-time diffeomorphism symmetry. But here for us, lambda is a parameter which can range in uh, various, uh, over various real values without violating perturbative um, unitarity. So then you can start with any such theory with an isotropic scaling and ask, how does it behave under randomization group flow? What are some of the relevant or marginal deformations that I can study? So I've listed a few here for the Lifshitz scalar. You can consider the spatial second derivative part of the relativistic like Lagrangian to be a relevant deformation. The parameter mu squared is now of positive uh, momentum dimension. And similarly, the mass term is of course even more relevant in dimension counting around this free field is equal to two fixed point. And this leads to very interesting phenomena. Now you can have new phases, uh, depending on the signs of these parameters, you can have a, a uniform condensate phase of phi. You can have no condensate, but you can also have modulated phases. If you put here the wrong sign, quote unquote, uh, you will end up having a ground state that's spatially modulated. And the same will happen for gravity. You, you will start with the kinetic term, and then you might start with some high derivative uh, term that defines the short distance uh, fixed point. And then you add all the lower derivative spatial, spatial pieces, such as the scalar curvature and the constant. Those will be the most dominant one. And you see that at least at the level of scaling, at low energies, the most dominant ones will be the cosmological constant and the spatial scalar curvature. So you'll end up flowing to z equal to one scaling. That doesn't guarantee relativistic symmetries, but at least the scaling is isotropic at low energies. And that's a very interesting first step in trying to establish how this theory can resemble low energy general relativity without um, overwhelming non-relativistic corrections. So this is just some simple drawing of a phase diagram for the Lifshitz scalar, and there are these modulated phases. So sometimes, uh, we refer to these theories as multi-critical theories precisely because there is a multi-critical fixed point here uh, connecting three different phases and in gravity also you can think of this as a multi-critical version of quantum gravity. It reminds us of some very interesting exciting work done on the lattice numerically by the group of Ambjorn, Lowell and others in Europe um, in Copenhagen and Nijmegen and in Poland and other places, uh, these people have studied a discretization of the path integral of quantum gravity, essentially with a preferred foliation in space time. And they found that the discretization leads to a continuum limit that looks like a macroscopic four dimensional universe at long distances, but at short distances, it effectively undergoes a reduction by two to a, an effective two dimensional space time. So we have an explanation of that now using this analytic approach of Lifshitz gravity, where you explain this seeming reduction of the number of space-time dimensions, not as a topological uh, reduction from four to two topological dimensions. Instead, the reduction is an effective number of uh, how many uh, spatial dimensions scale as one time dimension. So we start with a four-dimensional space-time, and if you postulate a short distance fixed point with z equal to three, uh, then you end up uh, counting each of the three spatial dimensions as if they contributed one third to the total dimension count due to the anisotropic scaling. So you, you encounter the same effective reduction of the spectral dimension to two that they saw in the, the numerical approach. So we are, we are conjecturing that these two approaches are basically two sides of the same story, the analytic version of this quantum non-relativistic gravity theory versus the lattice formulation of the same. So we are hopefully all studying the same continuum fixed points. So this is just what I said earlier that the low energy scaling will always be equal to one in this Lifshitz gravity. This will not play an important role for us. So let's not dwell on that transparency too much. So now finally, I'm able to explain the third ingredient or summarize 
Of course, this is well known, much more so perhaps than to uh, non relativistic gravity. So I'm not going to be spending infinite amounts of time surveying the third ingredient, the topological quantum field theories of the cohomological type. But I want to at least illustrate what I mean and hopefully avoid preemptively some confusions. So there are at least <clears throat> two broad, broad classes of quantum field theories, which are called topological. And uh, the, the two archetypes that illustrate the distinction are the Chern-Simons theory in three dimensions. So we have some really compact primary, primary, but sometimes even non-compact uh, Lie group. And uh, we provide a connection A on space-time and uh, then we can write in three space-time dimensions a Lagrangian using the Chern-Simons three form written here. And that's, of course, a famous topological theory. It's topological for several reasons. That the gauge field does not propagate local polarizations of the photon or the, the gluon in three dimensions. Um, we are not adding the F squared uh, kinetic term. Uh, so there is no physical polarization and the observables are things like Wilson lines and correlation functions of Wilson loops. So that's a famous topological theory. Formally for writing down the Lagrangian, we did not need the metric. And there is a nice quadratic part in the Lagrangian. So there are well-defined propagators. Once we gauge fix the standard yang mills gauge invariance of the Lagrangian, you can de develop Feynman rules, you have a, an interaction piece and so on. Of course, it's often useful to regulate the theory a little bit by placing it in a space time with a fixed metric and maybe refer to that metric in the process of making sense of the path integral. But formally, this action did not depend on the metric and therefore it is topological in that sense. This is not the type of theories that I'll be interested in. So hopefully this is not too disappointed, disappointing to those of you who are studying these types of field theories. These are fascinating topological theories, but not the ones that I'll be invoking in making contact with Perelman. So the second class is the one that I'll be interested in. Those are theories of the cohomological type. That's a somewhat technical term introduced by Edward Witten when he was constructing these theories starting from 1988. Those are theories for which I postulate also perhaps some gauge symmetry like Yang-Mills gauge symmetries. But primarily, I postulate that there's going to be another topological gauge symmetry, which effectively takes the, the field and allows it to be arbitrarily locally deformed. So that means that if I construct invariance under this topological symmetry, the actions will be only a collection of topological invariants such as indicated here for the case of four-dimensional Yang mills. So four-dimensional topological Yang mills, topologically twisted supersymmetric version of Yang mills is an example of such a cohomological type quantum field theory. The Lagrangian invariant under all the symmetries is a, is a topologic, sum of topological invariants. And in order to even make sense of any kinetic term and interaction pieces for Feynman rules, you have to uh, construct the gauge fixed version of the topological theory by postulating the existence of the BRST charge, which is constructed out of the gauge symmetries that you have inputted into the definition of the theory. So you end up with a BRST charge Q that squares to zero, or sometimes in an equivariant version, it would square to some secondary gauge transformations. And then you use this Q to form the non-trivial part of the action. This is where all the dynamics will be located. This is where the path integral will start making sense because we'll be able to split this term into a propagator quadratic part versus the interaction pieces. This entire thing is BRST exact. It's Q of something. Oops, what happened? I clicked on the wrong, the wrong thing for the moment. So Q is, um, is the, cohomology operator in the theory. And psi here is some local operator that you suitably construct out of the original fields of the theory. You have to add ghosts and anti-ghosts and auxiliary fields invoking the entire BRST machinery. So psi is known as the gauge fixing fermion and it effectively produces a term that is BRST exact. Therefore, it should not influence if I put a coupling constant here, the correlation functions should be 
uh, at, at least within some range where the theory is not degenerating, uh, should be independent of the coupling because this term is BRST exact. And as far as I, I'm, as, as long as I'm interested only in physical observables or operators given by cohomology classes of Q, then physical correlation functions of these non-trivial cohomology objects will be independent of how you put in additional exact terms in the action. So that's roughly the idea of these cohomological type field theories. And uh, the most famous example perhaps early on was the topological version of four-dimensional Yang-Mills leading to donaldson witten invariants and things of that nature. So let's just see how the general recipe for constructing such theories would work. Witten provided or already in the early days after constructing the simplest, most exciting examples of topological cohomological type field theories, provided a recipe how you can construct a broader class in principle of such theories. And that's exactly the recipe that we will be following for Perelman's uh, Ricci flow. So you construct a theory by first specifying your gauge fields or matter fields that uh, you, you want to start with. Then you postulate some set of symmetries, typically gauge symmetries. And then you choose suitable equations that will be used in order to gauge fix and localize the path integral to solutions of those equations. So for the example of topological yang mills in four dimensions, the fields will be again a four dimensional connection which takes values in some, so we have specified some compact Lie algebra or Lie group. Um, we have gauge symmetries, which will be two different gauge symmetries. There, there is an overlap between them. So one of them is just the conventional uh, gauge symmetry of the Yang Mills type. Epsilon is a Lie algebra valued um, local parameter of the gauge transformation known from physical Yang Mills, but a secondary even more important symmetry is allowing an arbitrary deformation of the gauge field by an arbitrary uh, function of space time. So there's an overlap between these two and the overlap between these two symmetries leads to the famous fact that the full BRSD gauge fixing of these two overlapping symmetries requires not only ghosts and anti-ghosts, but also ghosts for ghosts. So those technicalities aside, uh, the third step is to choose equations. And in this case, Witten chose the self-duality equation that, that defines the instantons in Yang Mills. And therefore, once you construct the BRSD charge appropriately, introducing all those ghosts, anti-ghosts, and ghosts for ghosts, and auxiliary fields, choose the fermion psi to gauge fix such that it enters the localization to the instanton equations. The path integral so constructed will automatically at least formally localize to the moduli space of the solutions of the chosen equation, in this case, the instanton equation. So there are, of course, various subtleties. They have to do with various degenerate connections and uh, singularities in the moduli space of such solutions and so on. But at least formally, you can argue by simply using the BRST exactness of the gauge fixed fermion part of the Lagrangian you can argue that the semi-classical expansion will be exact at one loop and uh, it will be dominated by the classical solutions which are exactly those instanton equations. So this is the logic of cohomological type field theories. And now we'll start putting things together. So um, most of that putting things together will be of course done in lecture two next week, but at, at least we are hopefully now on the same page and we have uh, a clear idea of what the ingredients are that we are now trying to co uh, connect. So now I want to construct using this recipe from the previous transparency, I want to construct a theory of quantum gravity. So my fields that I'm going to specify uh, will live on a space time, which again is foliated by leaves sigma of constant time and for simplicity, I don't want to deal now with topologically complicated foliations. Let me assume for the time being that the space time is just topologically trivial. It's some perhaps compact space time dimension, space time d dimensional manifold. I don't want to deal with boundary conditions at infinity, so we can just choose sigma to be compact. And 
cross a time interval and let's not study the boundary conditions at the initial or final moment of, in time. Let's just try to construct the bulk of the theory in terms of imposing symmetries in the bulk and seeing how to construct the appropriate um, Lagrangian. So I will start with a um, basic field, which is going to be just a spatial metric. I'm not yet adding lapse or shift. We will do that in steps because the construction is already complicated before you start adding laps and shift. So, so far we are working with just a spatial metric and we'll postulate that the theory has a topological symmetry, which I'm gauge fixing using the BRST uh, formalism, postulating that the BRST charge acts on the metric such that the right-hand side is by definition what I would call a ghost field. So notice the ghost here has the same tensor structure as the metric itself, but of course it's a fermionic field because Q is an anti-commuting uh, charge, Q squares to zero and maps bosons to fermions. Now in Witten's recipe, the step that chooses the equations is very important. And we are planning to choose Perelman's Ricci flow equations, or at first, for starters, let's just choose the original Hamilton Ricci flow, which does not have any dilaton yet in it, just a metric. We wish to choose the equations for the construction of the path integral to be the Ricci flow equations. And those, as you remember from the first transparency, they have the same tensor structure as the metric itself. There are two tensors, symmetric two tensor equations on space. And in turn, the choice of the equations determines what other fields besides the original field and the ghost you have to add. You have to add an anti-ghost here called chi, which is, which is going to be a fermion. And you have to add an auxiliary field, which is a boson. So this is another trivial BRST multiplet that I'm adding. I'm adding an anti-ghost and an auxiliary field. You can also define usefully a ghost number saying that the ghost number of the ghost is plus one, ghost number of the anti-ghost is minus one, G and B are of ghost number zero, and Q of course carries ghost number plus one. The reason why I introduced the anti-ghost and the auxiliary again as symmetric two tensors has to do with the fact that the anti-ghost and the auxiliary have to have the same tensor structure as the equations that we plan to localize the path integral to. And in this particular case, unlike in Yang-Mills, in Yang-Mills, the equations that you localize to are instanton equations. So they're a self-dual two tensor when the original field was a vector. Here, there is a symmetry between the ghost and anti-ghost. They are sections of the same bundle. And it's useful to promote this symmetry into a principle it simplifies the construction of a theory and leads to a very special subclass of possible theories. We will postulate that this symmetry persists. And in fact, we'll postulate that besides the supersymmetry Q, the BRST charge, there's also an anti-BRST charge, which would map Q to chi. And uh, um, it would carry ghost number minus one. And it will lead to the so-called balanced theory. This is a technical term in the theory of cohomological type field theories, a theory which has a symmetry, roughly speaking, between ghosts and anti-ghosts. So it will be natural to um, assemble these four component fields, the two bosons and the two fermions, into one superfield by introducing, besides the spatial coordinates x, k, and the time coordinate t, will promote the space-time, the non-relativistic space-time uh, foliation into a superspace by adding two individual fermionic components. They are denoted following the, the tradition in physics, denoted by theta and th theta bar, but the bar here is not a complex conjugation. They're both real quantities. Theta and theta bar are just two real Grassmannian variables. So the bar is more like an index than a complex conjugation. So I have four real fields, field components assembled into this simple superfield. And I have a very simple non-relativistic version of n equals two superspace. So let, let's first construct the simplest possible version of topological gravity of the Ricci flow, just trying to forget that later on we'll have to add a dilaton and that later on we want to 
um, allow space-time diffeomorphism foliation gauge symmetries and have a lapse and a shift variables. The simplest theory will be what we call the primitive topological gravity of the Ricci flow. Uh, in superspace, we can postulate these realizations of the BRST charge Q and the anti-BRST charge, which I'll call Q bar. Um, Q will simply act by a derivative with respect to the theta parameter that reproduces the uh, standard um, action of the previous transparency that we constructed here. So Q acts correctly when I represent it on the superfield by the derivative with respect to theta. For Q bar, I choose a different uh, representation. I choose d by d theta bar plus this additional term. And this will be important for us if we don't deform the naive BRST, anti-BRST algebra, which would contain only Q squaring to zero, Q bar squaring to zero, and their anti-commutator being also zero. If I don't deform it to this fancier super algebra where Q and Q bar anti-commute to a time derivative, I would not be able to establish the contact with the Ricci flow. So this is certainly a deformation of the BRST and Thai BRST algebra, which is consistent with the preferred role of time. And if that's uh, true, then there is no reason why we shouldn't postulate this particular form of the super algebra behind the construction. So this will be my, my assumptions. And I will indeed, at the end of the construction, interpret Q as the cohomology charge defining the physical states. So it's only going to be cohomology classes of Q that are supposed to be physical. And that will mean that the uh, bulk of the local components does not contribute to propagating physical de degrees of freedom. So that's why it's going to be a topological theory of the cohomological type. So how do I construct um, an action, again, we are choosing this route through superspace because it simplifies the notation. If I wanted to, I could have constructed the entire action in components, but it would be awfully complicated. It looks much easier to do this in superspace. And that was the path that we chose for paper one of our sequence. So in order to construct invariants under the symmetries that I will be postulating in, uh, so what are the symmetries? The symmetries will be the spatial diffeomorphisms acting on the metric, uh, but only time independent ones for now in this primitive version of the theory. Later on, we'll promote them to space time dependent diffeomorphisms, but that comes only later, presumably at the beginning of our next lecture. So here, in order to construct things that are nicely invariant and therefore um, represent topological gauge fixing, or this is a Q exact term, uh, I introduce covariant superderivatives D and D bar. They're constructed in such a way that they, they nicely anti-commute with Q and Q bar. And using these ingredients, it's easy to write down uh, kinetic and potential terms. So the kinetic term will be an integral over all of superspace. Uh, and here I have the um, square root of the determinant of the super field metric providing the volume element. Uh, there is no lapse and shift, so there are no factors of one over n anywhere. And just like we saw precisely in the case of um, bosonic Lifshitz type physical gravity, there are two kinetic terms. Each of them contain dg and d bar g, the superderivative and the conjugate superderivative acting on g. But the contractions are possible in two different ways with that same exact parameter lambda that we saw earlier in the bosonic uh, Lipschitz gravity. So we have the same pattern that there is a new parameter lambda, which is consistent with the symmetries. And then for the potential term, it will be sufficient for our purposes to look at the lowest two terms. We will not have to add more derivatives. And uh, this might be surprising perhaps, but uh, you should remember we are constructing this action in superspace. So when we have two super derivatives in components, this will give us terms that have two time derivatives. And this term here will lead to things with four spatial derivatives. So including this coupling constant alpha sub r and the constant alpha lambda is sufficient to produce a theory which is already containing z equal to two short distance scaling. 
So this will lead to two time derivatives. This will lead to four spatial derivatives in components, but in superspace, the number of derivatives is lower uh, than what would have to appear in components. So that's why the superspace formulation is so much more compact and useful. So again, to summarize, we'll basically introduce couplings lambda here, and then keep only the lowest two terms in the spatial derivative part of the action in superspace. So then you can ask um, when I do integrate over these fermionic variables to reduce this from superspace to the component formalism, what do I get? You get a complicated action, but uh, if I only keep the bosonic terms for simplicity to illustrate what happens, I'm dropping all the fermionic terms. They're there for the ride. They do their own proper thing, but the bosonic terms have a very interesting structure. So there is the auxiliary field B, there is a one time derivative on G. You can certainly integrate out the auxiliary field B, it appears only quadratically, and that will lead to a Lagrangian, which is of second order in first time derivatives in components. The parameter lambda stays there, and it indeed would produce the type of uh, standard bosonic kinetic term parameter lambda for Lipschitz gravity. On the other hand, what happens when you um, look at the potential term, it is linearly proportional to the auxiliary field with things like the Einstein tensor of the spatial metric plus a cosmological constant term. So it localizes to solutions. So the path integral, um, because it was constructed so carefully to have the BRST supersymmetry, you can use the st same standard arguments and find that the localization of the path integral instead of to some instanton equations will be now to the solutions of this equation. And this looks very much like a Ricci flow equation. In, in fact, when you plug in the values of lambda tilde, choose alpha lambda equal to zero and alpha r equal to two, you will see that the right hand side when you vary w uh, with respect to um, the metric, you get precisely the, the Hamilton Ricci flow. So I think um, we are basically out of time for lecture one, but this is a good place to stop because so far we have summarized all the ingredients, all the three different things that are being put together. And we found that we, when we put them together in the simplest, most primitive possible way, namely without postulating any space-time gauge symmetries besides spatial diffeomorphisms that are time independent, we haven't added the lapse function, the shift vector yet, but we have already made contact with the precise form of Hamilton's Ricci flow for specific values of the couplings in this primitive topological theory. So uh, the punchline might be for, for to summarize today's construction, while it is true that the um, Hamilton Ricci flow does not follow from the variational principle, it does follow as a kind of BPS condition from the localization of the path integral in a topological gravity, which itself follows from a variational principle. So that's that's um, our result number one along the path towards establishing the connection between physics and mathematics of the Ricci flow. Perhaps I should stop here and open the discussion for questions. By the way, if you want to take a little more time, it's not really a problem just in case, but if you if you think it's a good time to pause, it's also- This good. might be a good time to pause. I can. Mm -hmm give you a quick preview of what comes next. What will come next, we'll try to incorporate the re remaining space-time metric fields, namely the lapse and the shift. The shift vector is associated with gauging spatial diffeomorphisms. So now the next step will be to use our superspace to add a superfield version of the shift vector and construct a superspace action, which is now gauge invariant under space-time dependent spatial diffeomorphisms. And then later on, we'll add even the time reparameterizations in step three. So in these three steps, we'll construct more and more complicated, but also more and more gauge invariant theories where the gauge symmetries will be both the topological symmetry and the space-time foliation preserving diffeomorphisms. Similarly to what in yang -Mills topological case would be the space-time gauge symmetry of the yang -Mills type versus the topological symmetry acting on the deformations of the gauge connection. And then we'll see finally what the interpretation is of the lapse 
and shift in the language of the mathematical theory of the Ricci flow will have a very useful role for both the shift vector and the shift vector will end up being related to the Datturk trick and will have a very useful role for the lapse function to play. And the lapse function will turn out to be surprisingly enough related to the Perelman dilaton. So that will be the main points to discuss next time. And then once we construct these two um, refined theories with more gauge symmetry, we'll be able to ask where exactly in the space of couplings is the Perelman Ricci flow equation because generally these theories have more couplings, depend on more parameters and therefore provide a broader definition of flows that are generalizing the Ricci flow that Perelman studied. But Perelman one can be found in a very precise point in the space of couplings and we'll discuss uh, some properties of that next time. So that's, that's the preview and, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions about any topics that have been presented so far. Okay, thank you, Professor Hojava. Thank you. Yakui or And question from the audience, please. I have a technical question. Uh, so in BIST formulation, we have a ghost number and in SUSI we have R charge. Are you identifying, are you I mean, identifying these two number? Um, basically, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll be I'll be imposing the um, Gauss number conservation, and of course, in this case, this will be very different from the case of Yang Mills, where you are used to the fact that there is a Gauss number anomaly, and it leads to the non-trivial dimensions of moduli spaces. That's because basically the ghosts and the anti-ghosts are not sections of the same bundle. So, <clears throat> in this case. Because we have postulated from the beginning that the ghost and the anti-ghost are effectively the sections of the same bundle, they will not contribute different amounts to a potential anomaly. Therefore, the prediction is because of the balance condition, uh, the dimension of the quote unquote moduli space on which you localize should be zero. And that's indeed what you find in the Ricci flow theory. There is a lot of effort uh, shown to demonstrate the uniqueness and existence of solutions. If you set an initial condition, then you can prove that for some epsilon, there is a unique solution. And uh, um, the moduli space, quote unquote, consists of just one point, consistently with the vanishing of the Gauss number anomaly. So the Gauss number will at first be imposed as it is here in this construction as a classical symmetry. So I have postulated here without saying it explicitly that I'm only allowing terms in the action which are of ghost number zero. But that statement will continue being true for the full quantum theory because the cancellation between ghosts and anti-ghosts into a potential anomaly will take place due to the balanced condition. I see. Uh, so you mentioned the Q bar you defined by a defor def deformation. With a my question, the second question related to the first question, whether this deformation raises some symmetry because you have a symmetry behind it. So you can use that symmetry to deform the Q bar. So, so I, I have a hard time uh, understanding. I don't know, maybe the connection is breaking down a little. Okay. I, can you please repeat the question? Yes, of course. Uh, so you mentioned that you, defo you deform your Q bar by, by an extra turn there. So can you mean whether this extra turn is because there is an underlying symmetry? Whether you can do the deformation. Well, the, the, this is up to us to, to postulate whatever super algebra we want to impose. And uh, um, we could have postulated the, uh, maybe it's the wrong choice of words that I, if I called it a deformed algebra, I'm just trying to make contact with what uh, in the theory of, let's say, Yang Mills uh, gauge theories, people call the BRST and anti BRST symmetries. And in that case, if I want to keep that same terminology from relativistic theories, Q and Q bar, the BRSD charge and the anti-BRSD charge, anti-commute to zero. But here I'm seeing an opportunity consistent with the preferred role of time to add the time derivative on the right-hand side without spoiling any of the symmetries. This would of course not be possible in the relativistic theory because it would choose some particular direction in space-time, but it is consistent with our non-relativistic nature of the theory and ultimately, either of the two choices is a good choice. And it's a matter of 
which one gives you what you need. And it turns out that if we did not put the time derivative here in the super algebra, we would not be establishing a contact with the Ricci flow theory. So in order to construct a topological theory where Q is a BRST charge and we have the detailed, sorry, the balanced condition that there is also a Q bar, we need to pass through the anti commute to the time derivative and only then we can actually find the contact with the Ricci flow. Whether, whether, whether the other theory describes anything of interest, I have no idea, but it can be in principle constructed as well. I don't think it's going to be that exciting though. So we'll, we'll insist on this super algebra as a part of our definition of the setup and, and it's self-consistent self for sure with everything we know about topological symmetries. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Okay. This is a question from Yaunis. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, hi. Uh, I guess you, I think you already answered the question, but I, I'll, I'll say it anyway. Um, if you go to the next slide that you had, um, I was, um, I'm still trying to, I guess I'm still trying to understand whether um, the equation that you derived that leads to, to reach your flow uh, is a consequence of the fact that you're foliating space with a preferred direction, which is time. And if that equation would change now, if you start foliating in different ways. Well, the, the foliation was important for us to be able to have an, an isotropy between one parameter, which in this case is time and all the remaining dimensions, which is the spatial dimensions, because the right-hand side is dependent on two derivatives left hand side on one time derivative. So I need that an isotropy z, z equal to two between time and space. If I wanted to foliate in different ways, I can get more complicated patterns of flows on foliated Riemannian manifolds, which may or may not be of interest to mathematicians or may or may not be interesting to physicists, but it would certainly go beyond what we were trying to do here. Right, so it will deviate from having ratio flow. It would be different Absolutely. equations. It, okay. it might lead to some interesting or some really uninteresting uh, deformations of the Ricci flow equations. So really, what you're saying, so really, what you're saying is that the foliation that you're doing is actually is not really a, a tool for us to make sense or to. Um, study equations, but it's really necessary. You know, it's not a, it's something that, that leads to what, uh, what actually physics is telling us. Yeah, in other words, if I say it in slightly more mathematical terms, the Ricci flow equation is a weakly parabolic equation. So you need a weakly parabolic, um, an isotropy between the time and space in order to accommodate that. So if you were studying different kinds of equations, you might be interested in different kinds of foliations or different kind of uh, structures on space time. But in this particular case, the weakly parabolic nature of the equation forces us into this z equal to two anisotropy between time and space. So we have to choose that in order to land where we want in the mathematical land of all, all types of equations. But if you make other choices, you might end up, for example, you could, you could also go with the same foliation, time versus space, but postulate z equal to three scaling. So, and then you would be led to a theory of flows where the right-hand side has three derivatives. So it can contain in three space-time dimensions, spatial, sorry, three spatial dimensions. It can depend on the Cotton tensor, for example, which is famously of third order in derivatives. And there have been papers where people have generalized Ricci flow equations by adding higher derivative terms to the right-hand side I'm just not sure whether this is of strong mathematical interest or whether this is more, more motivated on the physics side, but certainly you can, even for the same foliation, you can choose the rules by modifying how many derivatives you are willing to add. You can add additional terms here and end up with a theory which has a higher value of the dynamical critical exponent at short distances. Or you can change the foliations. So the data that you need in order to specify some short distance uh, fixed point is to say, what is the foliation structure and what is the dynamical exponent that controls the scaling? 
So in this case, we had a space versus time foliation. And we are saying that we are interested so far in constructing a classical Lagrangian that has up to z equal to two terms, but we are not even adding those z equal to three Cotton tensor because we don't want to mess with the Ricci flow. And later on, this will be a, a very important question that comes back next time because we'll be asking under what circumstances is this theory UV complete, let's say in three plus one dimensions. And if we keep only the second derivative terms in the Ricci flow on the right hand side, this theory is formally non-renormalizable as a power counting uh, analyzed theory in three plus one dimensions. So by perturbative renormalization, it doesn't have the right to be UV complete, yet the mathematical results seem to tell us everything we need to know about short distance singularities in this theory. So there is no information that the theory would not be able to uh, give you about short distances. So in some sense, it's already mathematically UV complete, even though it's not non-normalizable theory by power counting. So you, you can combine these scaling ideas and normalization with uh, trying to make sense of the short distance behavior by perhaps adding higher derivative terms or arguing that there is a new way in which the theory is already as is equal to two theory, uh, you'll be complete. So that will be partially discussed in the second half of uh, our next lecture. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Well, th thank you for your attention. Thanks for all the questions. And I yeah. certainly look forward to our next uh, meeting next week. Same time, same same location, I think. Yes, next Wednesday. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. See you next time. See you, see you next time. Thanks.